first, I would just really want to thank the AJ Center for having us here. And it's, it's awesome, and this is a great space, and they've always been super supportive of the, of the anti-war committee and some of our, and a lot of our different activities. And this is an extremely important topic, so we're glad to see so many people here that are interested in learning about what's going on in Ukraine and also about the implications that it has for us as people living in the United States. Uh, the U.S. buildup in Eastern Europe I don't think is, is coincidental. U.S. warships have been deployed in the Black Sea, F-15 fighter jets and military personnel have been sent to Lithuania, and NATO troops are mobilized in Poland. In the last 20 years, 12 different countries getting closer and closer to Russia have fallen into basically into, into, into NATO territory. U.S. officials have coordinated with and given direct military aid to the Kiev government a government that came to power through a violent coup bankrolled to the tune of $5 billion by the United States. Uh, this has all culminated in a recent offensive against uh, uh, uprisings that occurred in Donetsk, Mariupol, and Odessa. Uh, while peaceful protests initially greeted the tanks that were rolled in through, from the Kiev government, uh, popular votes for independence and separation recently have been met by escalated violence on the part of, of Kiev particularly through the right sector and other fascist-oriented forces. In Chicago, we've already had two previous events relating to this issue. First, on the National Day Against Fascism, and secondly, a similar informational event. And at, at both of these instances, right-wing forces displaying right sector and Svoboda flags, which are some of the fascist-oriented forces, came to either directly try and disrupt through force or uh, to just basically try and counter the information that we're trying to put out. So it's I'm, I'm glad to see so many people here. Um, uh, the the anti-war movement now has has joined with us on a national scale, which is good to see. I think people are starting to realize the severity of what this crisis could entail, and the fact that this could lead to another war. Uh, UNAC and other national anti-war forces have, have have come to join us and call for national days in a concentration to basically spread information and to take a direct actions against you know what our government is doing and to not exacerbate the situation there that's already so dire. Um, in this spirit, the Anti-War Committee, which I'm a part of, has uh, raised these slogans, which are basically, no new Cold War with Russia, uh, no, no US support for fascist, or, or fascist atrocities in Ukraine, and money for jobs, healthcare, and education, and not for war. Uh, so we're, this is going to be an hour-long presentation. We're basically going to have three speakers. And then afterwards, we'll have a brief Q&A. So thank you all so much for coming. Um, first, we're going to have Rick Rosoff, who is the manager of the Stop NATO Listserv, which is an internationally recognized English language digest of NATO's war moves. And he's going to talk about the history of NATO's encroachment in Russia, U.S. intervention in Ukraine, and basically I've kind of summarize some of the events that have happened recently. So, Rick Rosoff. Thank you. I'm good. I don't stand up. I don't obscure the uh, the uh, visuals, which I've had a great deal of. But I oh, I'm sorry. I guess I'm to be a shadow. <laughs> Anyone who appreciates mystery science, the, uh, I'm yeah. the little creature, I guess. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Uh, I worked with the Eighth Day Center 30 years ago when we uh, worked against U.S. military intervention in Central America, and particularly against the uh, death squad democracies, as they were, uh, you know, uh, sardonically referred to as in Guatemala and El Salvador, and also the Contra War against the people in Nicaragua. So, uh, you know, they have a, a rich history in, in uh, you know, opposing military intervention. And uh, this is a period right now that where I think we've reached a, an order of magnitude substantially higher, even, than what had occurred in the 1980s in, say, Angola with the U.S. backed Contra Wars, or even in Afghanistan with the U.S. backing the likes of Osama bin Laden and other supporters of, uh, you know, extremist elements. You want me to speak up? Yes. <clears throat> Fifteen years ago, almost to the day, then Russian President Boris Yeltsin, a fond memory, you know, who certainly was not noted for standing up to the United States, which was his patron, 
I mean, after all, we stole the election for him, did, did we not, in the, the mid-1990s, uh, spoke while the, uh, NATO was conducting its first ever war, that is against Yugoslavia, a 78-day uh, air war onslaught against what was effectively a defenseless nation. This was, by the way, the first time a country in Europe had been attacked with full military force in an unprovoked manner since Hitler's Blitzkrieg Wars of 1939 to 1941. Yeltsin said, and I'm almost quoting him word for word. I spoke to the Americans, I spoke to the Germans, I spoke to NATO, and I told them if this doesn't stop, there may be war in Europe and a world war. You know, and I think people conveniently forget information like that because that's a very stark and that's a very frightening statement. Let me tell you something. If the name of the uh, email list and the website I manage, I inherited it incidentally from a young Spanish student in England who had set it up, Javier Bernal, uh, it was originally stop NATO aggression. Had NATO been stopped in 1999, we wouldn't be talking about the crisis we're experiencing right now, not only in Ukraine and in Eastern Europe as a whole, but this is a global crisis. This is a global crisis in many ways uh, more dangerous and potentially catastrophic than anything we may have seen in our lifetimes. What we hear today in the Donetsk region and the Donbas region in Eastern Ukraine is a military uh, checkpoint that was manned by US and NATO trained, incidentally, troops of the Kiev junta was attacked by local militias and the casualty figures I've seen are something in the neighborhood of, of in, in the scores, you know, 40, 50 people killed and wounded. Uh, so we're no longer just talking about um, uh, mass massacres as uh, that that occurred in Odessa on May 2nd. We're now talking about direct warfare in Ukraine. And Ukraine, of course, is a country that has a border, a 12 or 1300 kilometer uh, border with Russia. You cannot expect there to be a full-fledged war backed by the United States and its military allies in a country bordering Russia and not expect Russia to respond in some in manner. Now, even Gandhi, I think, would have had something to say about a situation like that. You cannot expect one of the world's two major nuclear powers, and let's remember that. We are not talking about Libya now. We are not talking about Afghanistan. We're not talking about the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. We're talking about one of only two nations in the world that has a major nuclear arsenal and a triad of delivery systems able to affect a nuclear attack or counterattack if it gets to that point. That's why what John was saying in his lead and is so important to understand. But first of all, we have to put to rest certain uh, uh, bits of disinformation, I think, and the slide here will go a long way towards doing that. And one of them is the U.S. and NATO military buildup in, in Eastern Europe, all the way from the Barents Sea to the, Balk the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea to the Aegean Sea, which is, say, the entire western frontier of Russia. The uh, buildup of interceptor missiles, such as in Poland, Patriot interceptor missiles, military bases, naval bases, air bases, special forces operations, marine task force, and so forth, that's been going on over the last decade, since the largest round of NATO expansion in 2004, where seven new countries joined at one time. Those seven countries are all in Eastern Europe, as John alluded to. Three of them are former Soviet republics. And immediately, the U.S. and NATO went to work in setting up military installations and deploying their military uh, personnel and hardware in those countries. So that what you're now hearing is the U.S. and NATO has to respond to Russian aggression in Ukraine, whereas in fact the chronology is completely the reverse. The U.S. and NATO have built up their, their military presence along Russia's western frontier. The coup d'etat in February this year in Ukraine, which threatened to bring hostile forces up to the Russian border, and in fact that's just where they are, was a signal to Russia that it defends itself now or never. This is a country, again, I don't have to remind you about history, that was invaded by the two largest armies that were ever fielded in Europe. Napoleon's Grand Armée and Hitler's six million troops that invaded in Operation Barbarossa. And let's also be very clear here, too. We are approaching the centenary of the beginning of World War I. We're only a couple months away. Uh, I invite you to go back on the internet or in hard, in, uh, hard copy and look at the statements made even weeks before. World War I began, and what you're going to hear is something quite like what you read in the New York Times or you hear on national public radio right now. There won't be a war in Ukraine because nobody wants a war. There won't be a war in Europe in, in, in 1914 because Germany doesn't want a war, Austro-Hungary doesn't want a war, Russia doesn't want a war. Nobody wants a war, but here it is. And what is happening right now is with the blustering that is coming out, particularly of major American military officials, Joe Biden, vice president yesterday, was in Romania in Romania at an air base, at a military base, an air base, 
speaking to U.S. military troops who are stationed there permanently. Now, how many of you old enough to remember the Cold War period could ever imagine there'd be U.S. troops stationed in Bulgaria, in Romania, in uh, Estonia, in Lithuania? This is unthinkable, but they're there, and they're there permanently. Uh, Biden was speaking there and said that NATO's Article 5 uh, so-called Mutual Defense Clause, it's really a war clause. The reason the U.S. is in Afghanistan with troops from 49 other countries is because Article 5 was invoked for the first time after 9-11 of 2001. And it states in so many words that if any NATO member state comes under threat or is attacked, it is viewed as an attack on the entire NATO alliance and every NATO member is committed to defend the one under, under siege. So that what uh, uh, Biden said yesterday is the United States takes Article 5, that war clause, seriously now and for all time. I mean, this is a degree of almost messianic uh, you know, grandiosity we're hearing from these people. These are not sane people. The comments coming from NATO's top military uh, commander, uh, General Breedlove, you know, trying to stir up a war in this uh, young woman's homeland, in Transdenister, similar comments coming from the Deputy Secretary General of NATO, Alexander Versbau, an American, you know, trying to expand the, the theater of conflict from the Ukraine into other parts of the former, the former Soviet Union are not the statement, uh, statements of reasonable people. These are people who either uh, are so bellicose and so uncompromising in, in their arrogance that they uh, will not tolerate any form of resistance, any, any form of challenge at all, and they're willing to resort to the most desperate measures to achieve dominance. Or these are signs of people whose uh, imperial hubris has become so pronounced that I think one can actually question their sanity, and I in fact do in many cases. Certainly Joe Biden's comments yesterday are not that those of a sane man. So what we're confronting right now is, is, uh, is a situation that is dire. Uh, I think the word was used by John, and it's an apt one. That what we're looking at right now is we've got to pull back from the abyss. We've got to pull back from the brink, and it's got to be done now. And if we come out of this thing uh, not uh, tremendously uh, scathed, and I mean the world, then I think we have to look very, very deeply at a number of other issues. You know, with uh, the last session of Congress that ended and the depart departure of Dennis Kucinich from one uh, side of the aisle and Ron Paul from the other, I do not know one uh, single representative in either House of Congress that we can count on right now to stop a drive to war with Russia. That means if we get through this crisis, we've got to do a lot of soul searching and look at the entire political system in this country. And the fact that we need to reform it so that we have voices like those poll after poll uh, demonstrate, exhibit that the, uh, the American people do not want to be involved in, in whatsoever in Ukraine, you know, much less in a potential military conflict with Russia. And that voice has to be heard and has to be heard clearly. And our political system has to be uh, readjusted to have that voice uh, reflected, similarly with the media and other things. But the immediate concern right now is this. The U.S. is conducting war games right now in Lithuania, in Latvia, in Estonia, in Poland, in Romania, right as I speak. The, there has to be a call not only to end this crisis, but to withdraw every single American troop from Europe. In fact, the U.S. now is going to be launching uh, th this year's iteration of what's called Juniper Cobra in Israel with 13,000 U.S. troops and thousands of Israeli and Jordanian troops. Guess who's targeted? We have to demand not only uh, to defuse this particular crisis, we have to go back and get to the root cause of it. And the root cause of it is militarism run amok which is very profitable for some, very deadly for others. People talked about the demands, including you know, health care and, and housing and jobs and so forth, American people. Let's remember, three years ago, the Pentagon spent $728 billion in one year on the war budget. In absolute dollars, adjusted for inflation, that's the highest since World War II. That is something like $2,300, over $2,300 every man, woman, and child in the United States. That is criminal beyond belief. And who is there in either house of the U.S. Congress who will condemn them? Uh, coming out of this is, is, has to be the sort of thing that's been suggested, I think, in John's introductory comments. There has to be an integrated effort by anti-war activists, disarmament activists, social justice activists, religious believers, everybody to come together and take a very serious look. We've been given a shot. This is a very shocking development. Nobody six months ago would have predicted a crisis of, this, of, of these dimensions occurring, and particularly where it has the potential for a direct military conflict between the United States and, and Russia. We've got to pull back from the abyss, we've got to reappraise our priorities, and we've got to make sure that something like this never happens again. Thank you.
Next, we're going to have Carl Rosen. Uh, he's going to speak about the views of the of uh, trade unions and the union movement regarding for our foreign policy, and also about the burning of Odessa's trade council building. Thanks. Good evening, everybody. Um, let me start by saying I am absolutely no expert on the situation in, in Ukraine, especially compared to the other two folks who, uh, who can speak to that uh, much better. I'm here to try and talk a little bit uh, about the perspective, not of the whole trade union movement, but from the, the independent uh, trade union point of view that, that my union has, uh, has always been known for. And when I say independent, uh, that means independent of the foreign policy of the U.S. government or of either political party. And a big problem, obviously, for the U.S. labor movement is that uh, the main result, one of the many res major results of the, of the Cold War was to uh, force um, most of the labor movement to adopt the foreign policy of, of the U.S. government. And uh, our, my union, United Electrical Workers, stayed independent of that. Uh, many other unions have now made their way to a similar outlook to ours, uh, some of them more vocally than others, uh, some of them more quickly than others, but, uh, uh, but there is uh, some hope that things are going uh, in, in the right direction. So just a few brief points kind of from that, uh, that perspective uh, in, in general is regarding U.S. foreign policy, in particular the, the Ukraine situation. Uh, so first, uh, from our point of view, U.S. foreign policy, whether the Republican Party is in power or the Democratic Party is in power in Washington. It tends to be run largely for the same purposes and sometimes even by the same people. Um, and that foreign policy is intended to serve the interests of corporations and their profits and not uh, working people uh, in this country or any other country. And so this results in a type of great power game uh, that led to World War I, as was already mentioned, uh, and many, many other con conflicts over the last century. Um, and, uh, and, um, and where, where the governments are, uh, are attempting to divide up the world or parts of the world for the benefit of corporations, resulting in the deaths of large number of working class people, the decimation of living standards, and the trampling of worker rights, while corporations make outrageous profits off of uh, whatever conflict is going on. And so I believe you can see this at work now in the situation uh, with Ukraine, uh, with the overthrow of an elected Ukrainian government with the U.S. Uh, playing a uh, large role in that and with apparent objectives that include the imposition of an IMF austerity regime on the Ukrainian working class and the further limiting of the influence of Russian economic interests that are not profitable to U.S. corporations. So from a trade union perspective, uh, we can also say that there can be nothing but great concern at the presence of fascist forces amongst those who now govern the western portion of the Ukraine. These types of forces throughout history always end up being used to attack genuine working class organizations. And the fact that the right wing forces massacred dozens of people inside a trade union building is more than telling. We can, we can take a lot from that in terms of the, the old saying of which side are you on. It's, it's uh, very, uh, it makes a lot of things very clear when that sort of incident happens. Uh, meanwhile, we watch the corporate-owned media in this country again fanning the flames, um, trying to cast the situation once again as the freedom-loving U.S. versus the evil empire. And just as with Iraq, Vietnam and dozens of other conflicts, we cannot expect that our media is going to report a more objective version of reality uh, until it is too late. What working people in both Ukraine and the U.S. need is for this situation to be resolved through peaceful negotiations. 
and we need our tax dollars spent on human needs, not on more war and covert operations. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Carl. And uh, uh, next I'm gonna introduce uh, Marina Dudanova, who is uh, the supplier of our uh, uh, slideshow here. And uh, she's from an autonomous area of Moldova that you probably will see at some point in a map on, on this screen, uh, if you don't know where that is. Uh, and she faced a parallel crisis around 20 years ago when right-wing forces attacked her country, Transnistria, and uh, under the, basically under the auspice of uh, democracy, but what resulted was mostly violence, and you, you, she'll, she'll elaborate on it. But, uh, and she's gonna speak about her experiences during that. So, thank you. So, pretty much Indian the presentation by showing you how U.S. officials are involved in Ukraine. Yeah. Probably recognize these faces. <laughs> all they, they all visited Ukraine, and Joe Biden's son is now um, part of the corporation that has uh, interests in Ukraine. Pretty much these are the Ukraine army losses. It wasn't possible yet to find out the um, other side's losses, but as you can see, along with the Ukrainian army deaths, there are also American contractors, and formerly known as Blackwater. This is the company from Iraq. They can say an FBI employees are killed, and the trickiest part is the bodies were never claimed. So, on that I will end the Ukraine portion. I can send it out or and post it on Facebook so that you, you have uh, your hands on this presentation. If you look at, at the videos, some of them are with um, English subtitles and there are English articles, Russian articles, I guess Google Translate works. Um, so feel free to research this page on your own to get educated. Uh, some of the videos though are very graphic, especially Odessa ones, so be careful there. Okay, that's that. I will finish with my presentation on um, Transnistria, which is the name that my country was called after it separated from Moldova. Oops. So what people don't know about Transnistria is that we had a war in 1992 for independence from Moldova, and it's not something we started, it's something Moldova came to my town and tried to um, pretty much make Russian-speaking population either leave or speak their language, which we never did. Um, and also they killed a lot of people left and right, so I'm gonna go through it um, to educate you on what happened with my town. And to show some parallels with what's happening in Ukraine, because many things are very similar. And it's scary how similar that is. So here is the Moldova region. Ukraine is on the side. Transnistria is right between. There are 450 kilometers on each side of the border. Uh, one border with Moldova, one with Ukraine. Right now, there is a um, black blockade between the two countries because Moldova has signed or is signing the agreement with EU and Ukraine wants to sign an agreement with the EU and that pretty much puts a stop to all trades between Transnistria region with any of the countries and there is no way out. So there is ongoing blockade right now. People are losing jobs, don't have much money and it's gonna get worse. 
So how it all started. Uh, as Soviet Union became weak, there were popular front of Moldova, they called themselves that. It's much, it was kind of a Nazi idea that Moldovians are in fact Romanians and they deserve to be the prime race and everybody else is below them, including Russians, especially Russians. So they tried to show that USSR was the same as Nazi Germany with this. And they did the first pogroms of Jewish cemetery, surprisingly, right, uh, in Argeev. And there is no real explanation to it. And Moldova government said, oh, it's just a vandalism. It's nothing. So after that, uh, Gagos, Ukrainian, Jewish, and Russian nationals living in our region uh, across the border, along the border of Moldova, um, decided that we want to have double language, two main languages, like we have in the US, US now, English and Spanish. We wanted to have Russian and Moldovian. Somewhere along the way, Moldovian, which was initially Kyrillic, became Latin, so it looked very much like Romanian. And Moldovian people started learning the Latin way of writing. Then disturbances came. In 1999, Ministry of Internal Affairs of Moldova Republic was vandalized by the crowds, and some slogans they used was great Russian nation should live in Russia, Jews into the Dniester, which is a river, Russians over the Dniester. And suitcase railroad station Russia is pretty much what they told us. Pretty much I was born in Moldova, and I was the occupant, how they considered us, right? So, there was first blood spilled in Gagauzia region, which was on the south part of Transnistria. In 1990, there were three people killed. And the way Moldova's um, national politic parties handled it, they pretty much acted like terrorists. They would come into your town, shoot randomly, people and then leave so you couldn't catch them on time or they would steal somebody and then a dead body shows up or a person would have a, a swastika or the red i mean five star um on their bodies burned or you know cut i mean it, it was very much like what nazis did so there was a referendum day on USSR membership that came up on March 17, 1991, and Moldova made sure that in Kishinev they had troops on the streets to intimidate people to vote correctly. And still, majority of people in Transnistria region, which was Sraspov, Bindera, Dubasar, Rydnica, we still voted to stay with the USSR. Over 90%, but nobody cared. So then Moldova declared its independence. On August 27, 1991, Moldova um, said they don't respect Gagauz nationals, and they kept telling Russians that we were occupants, we had to go. <coughs> and. Um, some leaders of opposition to them, which were our people, were kidnapped, arrested, tortured, or killed, and killed. And Mircea Snegur became the fir first president of Moldova Republic after <coughs> declaring the independence. This is the guy. Um, I s want to still see him trial for what he did to us, but that would be my next task. <laughs> Ho hopefully Amnesty International can also help me. 
Um, he's the one who sent troops on my town, pretty much. So in response to in Moldova's independence call and outlawing Russian language, which 19 schools out of 20 in my town spoke and uh, worked on, the Transnistrian <coughs> women uh, had a strike on the railroad, so no, no trains could come through. And we were the major railroad station town. And uh, people asked for freedom of the press, human rights in practice, not in, on paper. And um, then we started barricading. This is actually my town, the side of it. It's hundred. It was 130,000 people town. So we started barricading trying to protect ourselves. A guy got killed here. We, we had other barricades along. And then Transnistria Guardian Army was formed in 1991 to protect our borders from Moldova militants. And this is general of Russian army that was stationed in Tiraspol at the time. So as we sub separated from the Soviet Union, Russian army remained. I mean, it was Soviet army, then they automatically became Russian army. They didn't belong to us. But uh, we formed our own Transnistrian army with uh, those who wanted to fight. We even built our own armored vehicles. They didn't look anything like normal, but at least they were good to put blocks on the road so no other armored vehicles could come. And they actually participated in the fight later. So there were also some bridges with mines that, and here is a very strange picture. Uh, yeah. And then there was an attempt to blow the bridge so that no Moldovan army could come over onto our side. It didn't exactly work, but hey, Moldova used this picture to show how terroristic we were. All we were trying to do is protect ourselves. There was a fight for Dubasar, which pretty much had first people killed. And by the way, this is the guy with the star cut into his body after he was tortured. So this is the only picture I could find to prove that there was torture from Moldova's uh, militants. So after Dubasar, Dubasar offensive started on March 1st. So at that point, Mircea Snegu met with the president of Romania. And after that, we started seeing Romanian armory in Moldova army. And then Bindera invasion came on June 19, 1992. I was 14 years old. Not sure why the shooting in the center of the town didn't stop once it started. But eventually, an hour later, we had tanks driving into town and people being killed everywhere. There were over 50 snipers from Latvia mostly. Um, the sports shooters who were killing people back and, I mean, left and right, they didn't care. They, they killed the eight-year-old boy in front of my friend and her granddaughter. He was playing with the ball with her and they just didn't care who to kill. They were paid for every death they did. And so people started fleeing the city. Uh, some kids in the center of the town got stranded for two days until uh, their parents could take them. On June 20th, first refugees started fleeing across the bridge, the only bridge that uh, connected us with Tiraspol, which was our capital. And pretty much once you made it over the bridge, you, you were in safe haven. <laughs> but it was very difficult to make it go across. 
we, we actually stayed for eight days in town because we were just afraid that we would be shot on the way out. So for the first three days, this is our main building. It was shot pretty much to no recognition for two and a half days. Then the center of the town became ours again and then the outskirts were um, occupied by Moldovan troops for 40 more days and that's where my grandma lived. So there were a lot of destruction in the town as you can see. much how people houses looked in the center of the town thank god we were very poor so we lived, lived on the outskirts um, and that pretty much saved us in our apartment but the center was demolished so there were a lot of victims nobody counted exactly how many deaths <coughs> we encountered people were buried uh, pretty much on every street, wherever anybody could bury, bury a person, they did it. So it was not clear how many have died. But they say that about thousand were killed on our side of civilians, and uh, three to four thousand were hurt with bullets and stuff. So. Eventually, uh, after the first three days, which were the most difficult, some help came, and that's when the center of the town became more or less safe, and we could actually get out after eight days, but there were still snipers, so the good people, how we call them, they were walking around every street trying to listen and find the snipers. But who came to help? Sorry. Um, the, Transnistria Guard Army, they went across the bridge once the bridge was li liberated. Okay. And uh, I don't know where this file came from, but okay. <laughs> um, so after the ceasefire agreement between OSCE, Russia, Moldova, and Ukraine, Gendel was liberated by Russian peacekeepers on August 1st, 1992. People started to return home and that's pretty much what they had witnessed. Um, many tanks that were taken from Roman army, <laughs> we call them Romans, <laughs> and Romanians, uh, pretty much were taken into our army eventually. And I want to say huge thanks to Russian peacekeepers and Russian general Alexander Lebed. Uh, who actually was the, the one who orchestrated the whole peacekeeping mission. And eventually he said this, that um, he said to Tiraspol and Kishinev, uh, either you stop killing each other or else I'll shoot the whole lot of you with my tanks. And that's pretty much when uh, Moldovan army retreated from my town, left us alone. They stole a lot of goods, they killed tons of people and tortured them. They raped a lot of women, unfortunately, but they ran away from Russian army. And this is the General Levitt, and later on, he became a go governor of Krasnoyarsk region in Russia, and then he was involved in the helicopter crash and died on April 2002. So. As you can see, Vladimir Putin at his um, wake. And here are some resources. And this is the stand from the museum of that place. And this tambourine out there, it said in Russian, excuse us children for everything. So no, Romanian occupants knew they were not correct. But nobody apologized to us ever since. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Marina. Okay, uh, it is 7.45, and we are gonna have a Q&A section now for a while, so if anybody has questions for any of us, uh, I think we can try and do just one question and answer, and if it gets too overwhelming, then we'll start like doing groups. But if anyone has questions, feel free to pipe up. Everybody, right there. Yeah, I have a question for um, Paul Rosen. Um, I'm curious which, um, I mean, which labor unions in the United States were sort of the first ones to sort of come out openly in opposition to U.S. interference in Ukraine? I mean, which I mean, which ones were like sort of the the quickest? Well, I'm I'm not sure any unions uh, have been taking official positions yet, but the, those that are grouped around. Uh, U.S. labor against the war, you know, which came together to oppose the war in Iraq and uh, and Afghanistan, and and the ongoing war on terror and everything else we keep poking into. Um, there's started to be some discussions amongst the unions involved there, um, and uh, and uh, some of those where there's a big base for uh, unions involved in U.S. labor against the war is in the San Francisco area. Mm -hmm. So the San Francisco Labor Council has now come out with a statement that it probably is fairly similar to a lot of the points that I made mm -hmm. um, in terms of saying, uh, you know, this isn't our war, the U.S. should not be uh, getting involved here, uh, and you know, it's just serving corporate interests rather than uh, working people's interests. So um, uh, my union's started having internal discussions. We have, an, uh, along those lines, um, at a leadership level, we don't have a, uh, we haven't issued an official statement yet, but I would expect one possibly soon. And what U.S. Labor Against the War is doing right now is trying to do education across the folks who uh, have, have been involved in recent years in anti-war activities. So they've, um, they've put out a fairly general statement and then posted, they've got something called Ukraine Reader, uh, uh, up, uh, which is a way for people to access um, <coughs> viewpoints about what's going on and facts about what's going on other than what you would find in the, in the U.S. mass media. So it, the process has begun. Uh, bear in mind, uh, with the Vietnam War, it was almost 10 years of war before, um, before much of the labor movement came out against that war. Um, so we're, we're in much better shape relative to then. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, the U.S. labor movement is facing many crises right now. And, uh, and this isn't at, at, the, uh, at the front burner right, right now, but there are folks ready to take up this issue uh, uh, over the coming period as needed. Okay, right over there, and I'm going to ask a question myself after you. <laughs> my question is, for, I guess, is Rick. So what do you foresee happening after the, the, the Sunday elections? And in terms of escalation of the crisis, of the civil war, and secondly, do you feel like the, the lines are going to fall along the old Yanukovych coalition of the party of regions where you're going to have in the Donbass to, um, or whatever they want to call it, the Sinophiles call it, no you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, is, it is there, in other words, is the support the same in Odessa is, as there is seeming to be in uh, uh, Donbass against the uh, Kiev government? Those are all very good questions. Uh, I'll try to answer them as best I can without speculating too much. You know, we have to keep in mind that there was to have been a scheduled presidential election next March, which is, say, less than 13 months before this you know, the three-and-a-half-month uh, orgy of burning down most of the capital, murdering police officers, unarmed police officers, I might add, uh, you know, creating this, this fascistic orgy of terror in the city that uh, all people needed to do was wait for another 11 months and they could have organized. By the way, Ukraine has what we don't have, which is an actual functioning multi-party democracy, despite the oligarchs. Right, they have the Communist Party is in the parliament. The Socialist Party is in the parliament. You have, uh, you know, uh, uh, representing a wide spectrum of political diversity, unlike here, where again I defy anyone in this room to tell me of 535 senators and congressmen, one who will come out and, and stand in the way of the war hysteria that's being created right now vis-a-vis -vis Russia. So that's one thing to, to keep in mind. Look, we know that with all his faults, and they are legion, 
that Mr. Yanukovych did win the, the runoff election in 2010. That's incontestable. The United States recognized the inherent unfairness, the inherent fairness of the election and his victory. Nobody contests that. And I've had occasion on you know talk shows, radio, and television, and so forth, to say, and I know I'm treading on somewhat dangerous ground. You could pretend you didn't hear me. But if you were to take uh, Barack Obama's poll ratings right now and compare them to Yanukovych's in February, I believe Yanukovych would probably win. <laughs> and if it was justified to do what these Nazi terrorists did in Kiev, then w would they not equally be justified in doing something comparable in Washington, according to the logic of our adversaries? Uh, and, and this is, by the way, in a, in a system there where they had the right to vote for several different parties, form a coalition government, have a runoff election, everything we can't dream of here. Right? Now, the, the fact that the, the vote did break down regionally and probably ethnically is, you know, in the, in the runoff election in 2010, you know, it's fairly incontestable. That's going to happen in any country. African Americans don't vote the same way the Swedish Americans vote on average. Come on. You know, people in the Southwest don't vote the same way in the Northeast. These things happen in the country. But, you know, we're told that, uh, you know, the ethnic Russians in the East are pro-Russian. And that's very interesting. I mean, that's almost accusing somebody in the Midwest of being pro-American, isn't it? You know, because that's their ethnicity, that's their identity, that's their history and everything of the sort. But you, we have to keep in mind the biggest uh, uh, advantage the enemy has in this war drive, and it is a war drive. And I even contest that it's a civil war. I think it's a one-sided war. You know, starting a month ago, as many as 15,000 Ukrainian troops with several hundred armored vehicles, including tanks, field artillery, attack helicopters, you know, go into the Donetsk region. Please tell me, there's no one to fight. Right, some uh, slipshod militia are thrown together at a moment's notice. This is a war against their own people, or against sectors of their own population. And the fact that, again, no single voice in the West is raised, not even a misgiving of others, not even a, a insincere attempt to try to take an even-handed approach. You know, we will cheer on whatever achieves U.S. geopolitical uh, objectives, whether it's, you know, eating organs in Syria or burning people alive in Odessa. There, or uh, supporting gangsters in Venezuela. There is no death to which, evidently, Western for, foreign policy will not go right now to, to achieve their own objectives. There's not even a pretense you know, of, of anything decent or humanitarian or fair about it. So, you know, what's going to happen in the election? You know what's going to happen in the election. In Lviv and Ivan Frankovsk and some of these other nationalist headquarters, going to be 99% you know, in favor of either the Chocolate King Poroshenko or the gas princes, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Timoshenko. So you have a, a billionaire chocolate king or a multi-millionaire gas princess who just got out of jail for financial irregularities. And then we're told in the United States this was a great democratic revolution in February to get rid of the oligarchs. Oh, yeah. And then we have uh, Timoshenko, the gas princess, saying if she doesn't win, there will be a third revolution in Ukraine. Well, she's quoted saying this. She's also quoted on, a, on a, uh, you know, a, 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 an audio tape referring to Russians in the most slanderous terms. One of them is, and I'm very curious to know what it is in Ukrainian, the equivalent of the 12-letter English word that begins with M. I thought uh, she but, said that but, in Russian. Pardon me? I thought she said that in Russian. Oh, well, perhaps she did. But you know, even talking, you know, if this tape is authentic, even talking about nuking uh, Russians and so forth, this is a person who is supported you know, in large part by the United States, one of the two we're supporting, and who threatens that if she doesn't, well, let's try this in the United States, right? I declare my candidacy for president. And I tell people in advance, if I don't win, we're going to overthrow the government, burn the country to the ground, and stage a revolution. This is not, I mean, this is where it's gone from uh, just morbid farce in, into uh, equally morbid tragedy. This, this, uh, the, the, you know, the West stands indicted. The West, uh, Western elites and the Western government and their obedient media stand absolutely indicted on Ukraine like nothing else I can remember. Thank you. Um, so it, uh, for people that just came, there's a sign-up sheet in the back, and if you haven't done that, you should because uh, on the table, um, uh, pass it around, actually. That's a better idea. Let's pass that around. And a lot of the slideshow, if you missed that, is on there, which has a lot of good resources that Marina put together for us. So thank, thank you again, Marina. And so, and so a lot of that information is on there, so you should sign up, please. There's also T-Search for, for Sale from the Anti-War Committee around the issue of drones, which I must talk, please. please go to this one. And also some other information <coughs> out there. So uh, check that out if you haven't yet. But I had a question for Marina, which is I just wanted to ask you about uh, like how you feel the 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 there's parallels between 
uh, what happened in your country and what's happening in Ukraine now? Because I, I mean, I saw some of it in your presentation, but I would like you to be like more specific. How do you think of the parallel? <laughs> okay, as, as you saw in my presentation, we went from nationalistic party coming to lead Moldova, us separating or attempting to separate from them. Uh, what I didn't mention before was the reason we separated was not just the language. Once Moldovan government said they were Romanians, they wanted to join with Romania. And as you know, Romanians were fighting on the side of fascists back in the 40s. Our older population got so scared, they remembered those fascists. Romanians were even more vicious than Nazis, if it's even possible. So our population, the Russian-speaking population, they didn't want to have anything to do with Romanians. And pretty much that drove all of us to want to separate in case Moldova would move to Romania, <coughs> or join Romania, so to speak, or marry it, whatever the case is, right? So, after we separate, and this is exactly what happened with Lugansk and Donetsk right now, they want to separate from Ukrainians' crazy government, we call it junta, uh, I think that's the word for it. Um, uh, my prediction was, even before May 1st, is that they should be ready for military offensive. And that's exactly what started. Now, right now they are fighting around Slavyansk area, near Kramatorsk, but not inside the towns. Our town gave up arms. There were fighting in Dubasar, our town was peaceful. So we gave up arms, we had an agreement with Moldova that we're not going to fight, everything will be peaceful, and we trusted them, and then one time, one day, poof, and we had tanks in our town. Demolishing the town, uh, stealing from our factories, plants, schools. Uh, my school was... Uh, the most uh, prestige school in town, in the center of town. It, like all our computer classes, everything was demolished. It was shot at and pretty much the whole town became very, very, um, you know, like you could imagine the war town be. Thank God they, they didn't do much of air strikes, otherwise it would even be worse. So. I kind of predict, I'm afraid to predict, but the same thing can happen in Ukraine right now. If they go all the way with airstrikes, with using grad systems, which is pretty much shooting a bunch of... Uh, yeah, into the town and demolishing it. Same thing happened in Schinval by Georgia troops. If that happens, Thousands of civilians will be dead. And that region that separated, it holds about four or five million people. And now the Ky uh, Kyiv junta is calling them terrorists and, and think it's okay to kill them. And when they send the Ukrainian troops on them, and you have to understand, the Ukrainian doesn't want to kill its own, and they, some people understand that. Some think, oh, the, they are Russians, they can be killed. Some understand that these are our people, so they say no. What right sector does, they are behind them. They actually kill those who don't want to shoot at their own. And also, there is a whole new spectrum of, of this. We were hinted that a lot of organ donors all of a sudden are coming from Ukraine. Pretty much those who were hurt, instead of being treated to help, their organs are taken out in Kiev and in um, other towns and they are buried without even a grave. 
and nobody oh yeah and their families they're told oh they deserted the army they ran away so this is right now happening and it's a genocide it's really a genocide and it's a genocide against all peaceful population not just russians it's a genocide against their own ukrainians even though in my mind ukrainian and russians indistinguishable you cannot tell one from another i'm one eight ukrainian three eight russian and half jewish to me all three are the same in, in my eyes so just to be killed for speaking russian I can't even imagine the pain of that. Okay, thank you. So. Uh, do other people have questions? Back there. I have a question for you. Uh, in speaking, and your presentation was very informed, um, but in speaking about this, you use the term the West and stuff, and, and various terms like that. At times you said led by the US. Why don't you use the term US empire? <laughs> I think it's a much more accurate term. Uh, I don't disagree with you. Uh, let, let us say U.S.-led empire, but let us not let uh, the Western Europeans off the hook on this, too. Mm -hmm. They are every bit as imperialist. They simply don't have the ability to inflict it on the world the way we do. But, you know, yeah. watch watch the good socialist uh, Francois Hollande right now, you know, waging war in Mali, <coughs> waging war in the Central African Republic, and so forth. You know, when you put together, and somebody remarked this, actually it was even George Monbi, Monbiot in The Guardian, who's hardly the most daring person in the world, but he was forced <laughs> to acknowledge us a few years ago that every time, you know, the, the now former president of I Iran, if you remember, would get up in the opening uh, days of the UN Security Council and begin to speak, immediately, the US, Canadian, every Western European, Australian, New Zealand, uh, le Israeli leaders would get up and walk out. And he said, the white people walked out. Right? <laughs> you know, the white colonial uh, people who have subjugated the world for half a millennium, right? It's 500 years since Christopher Columbus, more. And, you know, when you look at NATO, what you're looking at is a consult. By the way, when NATO was formed in 1949, a majority of its members were and remain constitutional monarchies. A majority, 7 out of 12. But if you look at who, you know, the founding members and in the, in the, shortly thereafter are, it's every major colonial power. It's Britain, it's France, it's Portugal, Spain, Netherlands, Germany, Italy, Turkey. This is what you're talking about. And these people are used to running the world. And when the prospects of multipolarity emerge, and organizations like you know Brazil, Russia, India, China, uh, South Africa, BRICS, or now you know the phenomenal you know CELAC in Latin America, where every nation in the Western hemis Hemisphere except the U.S. and Canada you know, uh, have come together on common economic, and announced, by the way, in a, in a meeting in Havana not long ago, that they declare the Western Hemisphere a nuclear-free zone and invite the United States to join. <laughs> 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 you know, what we're talking about, you know, NATO, rep NATO countries represent about 800 million people. That's about, you know, a seventh or an eighth of the human race. But to listen to them talk, they are the international community. They are the governing elite. They are the civilized world. Right, and that's why I think the term empire is so important to use rather than the, this, the West or what. Not ignoring the, you're absolutely right, I agree with everything you just said about the collusion and the, and the involvement of all these Western European countries. I, I totally accept that. But the reality is, is this whole thing is being run by the U.S. The others have climbed on for all kinds of reasons, but I think for, for us to break through to the American people, I think we've got to put the term empire up in front. And what I find is about the only person that does that consistently is William Bloom, and that most of the left will not use the term empire. And I defy anybody to find this other than an empire when you, if you want to look at the, the discussion. Yeah, advice well taken, Kim. Term. And by the way, thanks immensely for the research work you did on the role of, role of U.S. Agency for International Development in, in promoting democracy in Ukraine for the last <laughs> <laughs> uh, Anybody else? Newland. What are Russia's interests in Ukraine? Uh, uh, what are U.S. interests in Canada or Mexico, right? I mean, when countries are contiguous and are uh, linked inextricably with each other, they're manifold, right? But, uh, but a couple of things. 
Uh, Ukraine is probably the second largest, uh, has the second largest defense sector of any of the 15 former Soviet federal republics next to Russia. It has 15 nuclear power plants. But, but for the most part, it, it houses, you know, the Russian Black Sea fleet, or did until Crimea left Ukraine, and did for centuries, incidentally, right? You know, uh, one, uh, something I, I'm forced to address, because if we don't do it, we're never going to uh, get out of this impasse we're in right now. We have been subject, I was born, born during the Cold War. I was born during the Korean uh, War. We were bombarded with, yes, anti-Soviet and anti-communist and other propaganda, but let me tell you something, there's a strong substratum of Russophobia, and when the communism disappeared, the Russophobia was still there. And they can yeah. still bring up these nightmarish bugbears. You know, and look at the terminology you see in the mainstream press in the United States, right? I mean, and these are perhaps Freudian slips, but they're very revealing. Look how often you see something like um, Soviet army massed on the Ukrainian border. <laughs> Uh, Red Army threatens Ukraine, uh, the Soviet Republic of Crimea, and so forth. I'm not joking, you see these things all the time. This is how much people are stuck in this rut. Uh, but also, and this is something that really appalls me, and you know, you know what my surname is, so you know that it strikes a little bit closer to home than it might for the rest of you. Like everyone on this panel. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, I, I get on uh, debates or on radio programs, and I'm told, but, but of course you know Russians have an innately authoritarian personality. You know that Russians are paranoid by nature. You know that Russians uh, you know, worship strong and abusive uh, autocratic leaders. You know that Russia, and, and this the things passes muster in so-called polite society, and you can't say anything to counter it, because then what? You're pro-Russian. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else? Where is the rose in that? I don't see rose. It's down there at the bottom. That's the Crimea, isn't it? Yes. Uh, no, no, no. no. In, inside. Oh, the, Crimea's over here. Like oh, red. Orange in the center. center. In the center, that's how that's it was rose. back in 1654. Uh, oh. Yeah. So pretty much all, all the pieces of land were given to Ukraine. And about what Russian interests are, you have to understand all the people who have lived there over the years they used to belong to Russian Federation, even during SARS and even afterwards. And all of a sudden, they are part of Ukraine, and the Ukrainians want to kill them. So obviously, those millions of people, and the whole population is 46 million. You have to understand it's a lot. And about between 40 and 60 percent are ethnic Russians. So if you kill those, what, 20 million, the same as during World War II that Soviet Union lost? It's a lot. Is it really 40%? 40 to 60% are ethnic Russians. I mean, there is not much of a distinguished there. <laughs> Everybody is mixed. There, were, there are families that part is in Russia, part is in Ukraine. We are so tied up. Even I have relatives in Ukraine, Moldova, and Russia at the same time. So. You can't imagine how <coughs> sick people are right now just thinking how their relatives can easily die there, you know? But there is no way out but the peaceful way out. Other people have questions? In the back. Yeah, I'm curious to see another perspective. Is, can you tell me something about the... Uh, Russian, Russian, Orthodox, no, Orthodox versus Western Catholic um, populations, and if there's contention there or what. Well, historically, everything in Russian region was Russian uh, Orthodox. Whatever was Catholic used to belong to Poland. That mm -hmm. was kind of gifted. There was a pact of uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop between Germany and the USSR. USSR was hoping that Germany wouldn't go into war with it, so they made a pact, they divided Poland, and this region became part of Soviet Union, and that's where Catholics were. Everything else used to belong to USSR. It was mostly... Um, Is that a factor today? Not much, but now it's becoming too, because even on Maidan, there were Greek, Orthodox, which I think is kind of Catholic side, they were actually praying for those mobs to succeed 
And what moms did, they killed a lot of uh, military forces of Ukraine. And eventually, even after the coup, after President Yanukovych left the country, they started targeting those military personnel and their families, killing them, punishing for standing up on that Maidan Square. It's, and it's still going on. And also the, the Greek language was one of the four or five that was proposed to be banned. Like outside of Russian, there, were all, there was other national minority languages, Greek being one of them. So it, it's interesting. It, it doesn't fall along with lines really easily of like where there's this like strong Catholic presence and then you know Orthodox. Like the Orthodox Greeks are being targeted by the Kiev government like anybody else by having their language eradicated from public education, you know, so. I just want to say, I think that, uh, that there's constantly, part of the job of the corporate media is to, is to make the situation blurrier and muddier for people that are observing. And I think one of the things that's thrown up by the media is this idea that it's, it's, uh, it's a conflict between Russians and Ukrainians, the idea that it's a conflict between uh, Russian Orthodox people versus Catholics, or whichever other religion that you want to throw in there, when it's really a conflict between Washington backed fascists and people who are opposed to fascism. You know, I think that that's the, the, the thing that, that gets lost if you read, you know, the New York Times or Washington Post too much, you know? And, and one of these, one of the things, it, 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 as, as we move forward, uh, there's gonna be more fake divisions that are thrown up by the press that, are, that is, is supposed to substitute in your mind for the actual real division between U.S. imperialism and the fascists on one side, and all of the Ukrainian people, whether or not they be Russian-speaking, Ukrainian-speaking, or whatever language they happen to speak, on the other. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's right. I think that that was well spoken, Eric. Thank you. And uh, people are welcome to make comments too if they don't just want to have a question. So, others. Um, I know that you know, primarily interested in the resources and. and um, the, um, the way our occupation is to get at Ukrainian resources, but doesn't Ukraine also um, depend on, on Russian resources? Is, isn't like the natural? Isn't there like a big contention with natural gas, for example, or um, or something of that nature? I, I, I'm I'm not sure. Sure. I, yeah, I'm sure Rick has a lot to say on that, but I would say that one of the main things is the oil pipelines that already exist that are running. Ukraine okay. so it's about a lot of it is about transferring uh, gas from uh, from Russia over into Europe which is like a, a big contention plus the, the Baltic Sea area is like a, is the most like a, a extremely strategic point for trade and but yet natural gas is like the big thing uh, in Ukraine itself but I'm not sure if it's so much just about resources it's more I think to, to, for me it's more about like geopolitical uh, presence and about like the actual territory of being next to next to Russia but friction. Oh, that's very good, John. You know, just a couple of things. Uh, Ukraine is basically a, an energy transit country rather than a producing country. But it is situated so strategically that there's no surprise it's being fought over, I think, as you know, people are alluding to. Uh, when the first uh, color revolution occurred in 2004, early 2005, the so-called Orange Revolution, and Viktor Yushchenko became president in the runoff, his wife, by the way, Kathy Yushchenko, born right here in Chicago, right, went to University of Chicago, you know, about the same time as, you know, uh, uh, Wolfowitz and Kali Zod and, and uh, Shalaby and all these other you know friends of hers probably went to Jimmy's together with Woodlawn Tap and the beer. <laughs> you can imagine what they talked about, right? I get this part of the world. You know. But it, but seriously, when he was in charge, he did something they called a reverse flow. And what it was was Russian natural gas going to Western Europe, largely through Ukraine. The uh, Baltic one you're talking about is what's called Nord Stream, which is supposed to go into Germany. But it was uh, Russia was supplying an estimated 30 to 35 percent of the natural gas to the European Union, which is, as an entity, the largest energy consumer in the world. Right? I mean, the European Union, not its uh, separate parts, consumes more energy than the U.S., which is number one country. And then after that, you have to go to Asia to find the next four. What the U.S. is concerned about is not so much, uh, you know, cheap oil. It's it's concerned about running the world and controlling energy uh, hydrocarbons in the first instance. Who gets what at what which price through which intermediaries? 
So that what happens in the Ukraine, is, and keep in mind again, you have 15 nuclear power plants. NATO, I don't know if anyone saw this last week, sent inspectors out to the nuclear power plants, which certainly raises a prospect that NATO may invoke you know, a nuclear danger is a way of, you know, seizing those plants or intruding militarily into the Ukraine. Be aware, that's a possibility. But, you know, the basic thing uh, with Ukraine is that Russia has to be knocked out of the European energy market, period. You want to understand the war in Libya, the war in Iraq, you want to understand the you know, American buildup in the eastern Mediterranean and the Caucasus and so forth, that's it in a nutshell. And uh, there's one of the more revealing statements I know, by the way, right after the Soviet Union fragmented, the Clinton administration immediately went to work, you know, making sure it would never be reassembled, right? You know, Humpty Dumpty would never be put back together again, and they did everything to ensure that wasn't going to happen. So one of the first things they did, they set up an informal bloc known by the acronym of GUAM, and it's revealing who those countries are. There's Georgia, Ukraine, Azerbaijan, Moldova. And the plan was to use those as you know, both uh, you know, corridors for, uh, for the most part for energy, but also going the opposite direction. Uh, the, the now former U.S. ambassador to Azerbaijan, one of the you know, richest oil countries in the world on the Caspian Sea, Ma Matthew Bryza, he made a statement about 10 years ago. He said the very same energy transit uh, corridor we created to go east, or no, I'm sorry, to go west from the Caspian Sea into Europe is now being used for the war in Afghanistan. And that's no coincidence. You know, the fact is, you know, oil and natural gas from east to west, troops from west to east, and they're using exactly the same quarter, some of which, incidentally, resemble to a frightening degree those of the Nazi Wehrmacht in World War II. We're getting near the end of time. Please answer. <laughs> but uh, we'll do two more questions with the end of time. But we'll do two more questions. With, uh, let's, let's try and keep uh, it brief because we got like 10 more minutes. But I have Joe and then this person, just to do people that haven't spoken. Sorry. Actually, I'm not. I'm asking a question. I'm just making an announcement. Um, so, <clears throat> my name is Joe Osbaker, and I'm with the Anti War Committee. Um, and we have a, another handout, um, which Isabella is going to help us pass out. Um, when um, when my my brother uh, Kim Sipes uh, says that the United States is an empire, um, I certainly agree with that. And the empire um, oppresses people all over the world. Um, and is uh, you know actively trying to uh, isolate and uh, strangle Russia and has been doing it through NATO for the last 20 years and before. But um, <laughs> one of the main targets of the empire has been the Palestinian people for a long time. Um, and our dear sister Rasmia Oda is from Chicago um, has actually been arrested and um, charged with a trumped up crime and she's going on trial um, in on June 10th in Detroit, um, and we're uh, uh, going to be taking buses up there, um, and we're asking everybody who's concerned about justice and concerned about the people of Palestine to consider taking a day or several days off to come with us to Detroit to, um, to stand with her and um, to try to defeat this attack on her. Um, and then um, the other thing is, um, is somebody going to pass the hat? Oh, yeah, we should do that, yes. <laughs> Any, I, I knew this old trade unionist who said, anytime you got more than three people in a room and you didn't pass the hat, that you were committing a crime against the people. <laughs> the work committee is, um, is organizing to rebuild the anti-war movement, um, and uh, if you can make a contribution, uh, a dollar, loose change, you know, more, um, please put it in the hat, and, uh, and, and, and thank you again for coming tonight. Ron Chef Hat and Master. Well, yeah, man, that's always prepared. I'm sorry, this, I don't know your name. Um, I heard that uh, Moldova was, there was talks about them joining, wanting to join Thank NATO, you, right? So, um, what are the prospects for um, further conflict in Moldova over that question? And how has it how well have you been able to tell your story to uh, other groups like this um, in the in the efforts to not go to not go there again, not, not repeat history? Well, my prayer is that the war that I witnessed will never be repeated. Um, my hope is very slim right now especially after U.S. talks on military exercises with the Romania army. And uh, 
pretty much right now it looks very much like NATO is preparing to shut down Transnistria by all means. On the other hand, there are several thousand of Transnistria army there. They can be um, brought up to 20,000, I think. There are over a thousand of Russian peacekeeper troops that have been there for years. Their families are there. They live there. So if any offensive will happen on that region, Russia will have to be involved. And that would mean the beginning of World War III, I believe. So right now, it's very tricky uh, time where I want to do everything I can to stop that, but I need your help. So this is my second presentation on Transnistria. The first presentation in Ukraine, kind of, uh, especially with the Ukraine slides. But I am going to continue to talk about the war I witnessed because the mass media, we saw this exact same thing that happens now. There, is, there was pro-Russian side, which was pretty much our side. Russian media was covering what actually happened in my town only a few days later because there was a lag in how fast information would get there. Uh, now with the internet, it's immediate. And Moldovian side was reporting everything exactly the same as Ukrainians now. So there was an informational war even in 92. There is one right now, the huge one. I'm I am one of the fighters in this informational war. I am in constant contact with people in Ukraine. I get a lot of information what's going on there. I educate with you with my slides. I educate Rick on what I get from Russian media that he probably wouldn't see and from people there who know what's going on. So I guess all we do right now is contribute to showing the U.S. people what U.S. government is doing to another country and that it would definitely lead to World War III with Russia and China if U.S. doesn't stop. So what I would like you to help with is spread the information out and somehow figure out a way we all can stop it. Because truthfully, I don't want to die of the nuclear strike of Soviet bombs on US soil. And I don't want US bombs to kill my relatives in Russia, Ukraine, and Moldova. Thank so, you. Uh, thank Kathy you. in the back has an announcement, and then we're just we're going to wrap up because it's at. Uh, 825, but I want to make one more plug for our anti-drone warfare t-shirts in the back if you haven't looked at them. They're really cool. Homemade from design. <laughs> so, yeah. thank We've you. we got one that says, uh, no killer drone for Boeing. Um, I don't know how familiar those are, uh, but we're doing a campaign against Boeing to stop them from developing the next combat drones for the Navy. Um, so this is one of them, and the other one says, Boeing drones fly thousands of miles. Three copies of uh, Workers' World Books paper on the same table also. I have Kathy first here. So I just wanted to mention, maybe many of you already know, but you know, Kathy Cummins starting her walk to ground the drones. She'll be leaving on June 3rd from Chicago. They'll be walking 165 <laughs> miles to Battle Creek, where now the Air Force Base there is evidently becoming a drone flight center. So for those of us that can walk or go for a walk, Part of the walk, that's great, but if you can, if you can send a little bit of money, I know that really helps them with the food and uh, the expenses of that and walk. Thank you so much. And one more from Dale. I wanted to remind everyone that tomorrow, Chicago is participating in an international uh, international issue of closing Guantanamo on Obama's one year anniversary of his third promise to close it. <laughs> so, if, if 
if you're interested, the rally starts at 4.30 tomorrow afternoon at Water Tower uh, Park, there by Pearson in Michigan. And there will be a march in the Gorilla Theater. But, uh, it's a huge event. Who makes it international? The UK and Mexico. I don't know why I do it at one time. It's a theft. Thank you so much. And can we have one more round of applause for all of our speakers? Yeah. 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 Can I say the last word? Um, when you go out, there will be somebody down there. We'll sign you out, but cannot go out without one of us uh, uh, letting you out through our, our security system of the building. So. In order for us to have these kind of things, we need to uh, obey the law. <laughs> At least today. <laughs> thank you. And thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. And take care too. I mean, do you think you could email me a copy of the, uh, It's all on my Gmail drive. Okay, great. So, uh, I'll just uh, get in touch with you through Facebook and leave you my email. Thanks. This is a great presentation. Appreciate it.